So I think we can start already. Uh, is there a voice in Zoom translation? Oh, I can see clearly now. So uh, good morning, dear colleagues. I'm glad to see everyone here today. Uh, we'll have a discussion, networking session on the topic of the future of the metaverses. I would really recommend and urge everyone to sit closer to the presidium as I think that this core format better be um, realized as a form of generic exchange of ideas rather than speakers speaking uh, their prepared reports. But keeping this in mind, we we'll still will have several speakers with prepared reports uh, on the topics of the development of the metaverses, on the future of metaverses, on ethical reasons behind the development of such technologies and general views. Um, some of our speakers are representatives of the civil society, others of the academia, and we also have uh, several people who are involved in uh, NFT and metaverse, metaverse development projects. So I've hopefully this session will be interesting, involving, and I really urge participation from everyone. Our first uh, participant of the discussion is the member of the, you'll be surprised, Russian Orthodox Church, Vachtan Kipshidze. Uh, I think that Vartang has joined us online. Uh, Vartang, can you hear us? I can see that Vartang is online, but maybe he has some technical issues, and we should start with another speaker, uh, Daniel Mazurin who is also online. Uh, almost all of our speakers are currently online. This is, should say something about the development of metaverses and online already. Uh, here I see. Daniel, are you with us? Okay. Ah, I can see. Vartan has joined us. Uh, it's uh, late uh, night at Moscow, but still, uh, thank you very much for joining IGF. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, forum. And uh, first of all, I would like uh, to start from saying that uh, it is quite natural for the Russian Orthodox Church uh, to take part in such discussions uh, about metaverse because uh, technologies nowadays are so developed that um, actually religious communities uh, cannot just stay uh, aside of these uh, discussions and particularly this is true about metaverse. Uh, what uh, do we consider to be metaverse to be? Metaverse, as I think, is a man-made world that is uh, controlled by, by man, actually. But however, the problem is with this world is that it claims to be, uh, you know, perfect. Uh, we religious people actually uh, get used to living in imperfect world. And actually, religions and Christianity, at least, uh, tries to find a recipe to overcome sin and, in, um, and the very fact that this world is imperfect. However, uh, 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 metaverse is a parallel world. And this parallel world sometimes uh, tend to put religions aside, saying that this world is circular and values which are actual in this world uh, um, have nothing to do with the religious values, which are widely uh, widespread in our contemporary, uh, not virtual, but real world. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to say that uh, imperfectness of the real world that we have around us, 
and everybody can actually test this in imperfectness on his own skin uh, actually goes to the uh, to the metaverse to virtual world which is being established by by us people uh, as we believe us just to the opposite the the real world is created by god as we believe as religious people so the um uh, i would say uh, the way how we combine these two worlds in our mind is very crucial and important for for us uh, uh my my main idea is about values how can we um, uh, support values in the real world and try to bring them to the virtual world to metaverse uh, it, it is not a simple task i would like to stress that our church uh, and, and actually tries to involve all technologies and particular in vir vir virtual uh, uh, in virtual world to actually for uh, for Christian testimony. However, uh, it is very difficult to go through to the hearts of people. And of course, uh, metaverse is a very material world and uh, as you know, even better than me, this world is actually directed by material value and material income. Uh, so it is very difficult to uh, religious communities to testify about values. Uh, here, during your session, as I, as I read, you are going to discuss not only I would say advantages, but also disadvantages of the uh, metaverses. And uh, particularly you, you will discuss crimes that are being committed there. Uh, and I would like to say that uh, these crimes, if we judge by the consequences of these crimes, are very severe because people sometimes can be actually uh, uh, deprived of their privacy. Uh, our church throughout its history uh, actually um, uh, testified that privacy is very connected with freedom. If you are deprived of privacy sooner or later, you will be deprived of freedom. And freedom is a real value of the humanity that could be saved and protected everywhere this is one thing and the other thing uh, for you to discuss is that uh, uh, our real humanity i would say humanity which get what used to living in the real world not virtual throughout uh, its history uh, found a way to uh, produce values and produce love. The most important value is love. And love is not a simple value to create and to establish. Life, love is always, uh, always grows in the context of family and the context of relatives, in, in the context of religious sacraments, if you are a, a religious person. All that is very, is very, I would say, questionable in the world of murder wars. So mm, I think that uh, here and at this stage of development of, of, of human race, we, th we should think about values and uh, how these values could be protected. And that should be our goodwill to go on the path of protecting these values. The other thing I would like to stress is that sometimes, and we all see that, people uh, um, are being obsessed by virtual world, by metaverses. And this obsession, uh, I would say, is very detrimental to the freedom and well being of human personality. Uh, again, we uh, 
humanity are very just well acquainted with obsessions of different kinds. And obsession of the virtuality is a new kind of obsession. And so if you want to somehow find a way to, to just fight this obsession, you should elaborate new approaches. And this is not a simple task. So with that said, I would like to thank all uh, uh, organizers of this forum and wish you good luck in your discussions. If you, if it is possible, just uh, I am I'm, I'm open to the questions that could come from your side. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Vaktang. Thank you also that you um, had the time to, to join us. Uh, and we would really encourage also our participants to ask questions, to engage, and hopefully you'll uh, stay with us during the whole discussion. I must also uh, tell a little bit about uh, the, our organization I represent and uh, that hosts today's networking session called Center for Global IT Cooperation. It's in the think tank, which deals with questions of digital development, transformation, uh, digital economy, internet governance, and all sorts of things digital. Uh, recently, we have contributed uh, an analytical report on the theme of metaverses to T20 within the format of G20. It was also dedicated to the ethical issues uh, which arise during the development of metaverses, during the uh, usage of metaverses, possibilities of crimes, uh, abuse, also, and also opportunities which metaverses can provide in terms of education, in terms of healthcare, uh, and all sorts of things which come with it. Uh, and I think that the uh, best way to elaborate on the positive side of uh, metaverses would be to give a floor to someone who deals with them directly, uh, works with projects connected to metaverses, NFT technologies, and uh, metaverse enabling technologies. Today we have with us uh, our dear friend Daniel Mazurin, a young interpreter, inter entrepreneur, businessman, startupper, uh, our uh, guru. Daniel, is everything all right? Do you have yeah, the yeah, possibility awesome. to speak? Great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alim. Long time no see. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Always, you know, always grateful for opportunities that, um, that uh, uh, UN and you uh, give us. So I would like to, from, from the technologist's um, point of view and coming from the uh, private sector, um, I would like to start with um, with one thesis, and um, uh, this thesis is uh, that we are um, living and looking at one of the most, if not the most interesting period of uh, human history in terms of uh, technological integration into our uh, society and our daily lives, um, and I'm specifically talking about the artificial intelligence that we have to talk about today because Matters Tech and uh, AI um, are, are, you know, is, is extremely connected. Um, so um, I, I don't know about, uh, you know, technologies that we had in the ancient uh, Egypt, uh, forgotten technology, <laughs> but uh, in, the, in the modern society, uh, I believe that AI, you know, plays a very big role. And we've, we are already seeing a, a lot of users uh, uh, of uh, ChatGPT right, uh, AI model developed by the OpenAI. Uh, there are more than 180 uh, million users uh, daily, um, oh, sorry, monthly, uh, and it, it, was, it was a stats in, in, in August. And metaverse technology, as I said, is uh, very connected with artificial intelligence because we cannot develop a proper metaverse or virtual world or augmented reality world without uh, AI integration. So thus, um, I would like to state that, uh, you know, we're, we're living in a very, very interesting period of uh, human history. And already, you know, we've already tested uh, on ourselves how ChatGPT influences our lives. And the same thing would be, I believe, with uh, metaverse technology. Right now, what we have on the market, and the market is not very um, bright right now, of course, um, uh, because you know a lot of corporations and uh, what what's stated in the description 
of, of, uh, of the agenda, you know, a lot of corporations are stopping to develop metaverse tech. Why? Well, it's, uh, I don't know about the, the directors of the corporations, but I can see a lot of startups, uh, especially in the uh, third world countries, um, developing metaverse projects and they're pretty successful. And they're being bought by many businesses and corporations. Uh, APIs are being used in terms of AR technology, for example, um, on the, on the, on the, on the, in the, in, in the business, in, in the startup uh, industry. So we're seeing a lot of things going on, but we don't see a real integration. Why? Well, um, personally, I think that uh, modern metaverses are not well, what metaverse should look like. Uh, metaverse should combine not only virtual worlds uh, with you know, VR Hamlet that you have right now, VR glasses uh, by Meta and other corporations. Metaverse should combine uh, real life too. And we can combine real life with virtual world using AR technology. Um, you've probably heard and seen recent news um, about Ray-Ban and Meta AR glasses. Uh, this is one of the biggest um, AR and Metaverse uh, products for um, um, integration into, into the society. It's a you know, brand new Ray-Ban and it's very good for youth and it's very cool. So I believe uh, by uh, making such mass adoption products, I will be able to integrate this uh, tech into our, our society. Well, why? Well, yeah, regulation is, uh, is, is a must, right? It, it is needed. We've seen what happened in the crypto industry. For the past uh, two years, a lot of scams, um, people lost a lot of money. So such industries, innovative industries, should be um, regulated, of course. Um, I'm not talking about the US regulation when you have to ban a lot of companies. I'm not saying about Chinese regulation where you just ban every, uh, every technology to develop by your own. Um, I'm saying about uh, uh, good regulation where you give an opportunity for businesses to thrive, give an opportunity for startups to uh, properly uh, make money and uh, improve, uh, improve the technology. And this, uh, this tech of, uh, like metaverse technology, VR, AR, um, AI should be regulated first of all in the third world countries. Uh, where this tech, innovative, uh, innovative tech, gives opportunity to increase GDP, to um, increase quality of, um, of, of uh, people's lives, uh, and uh, overall just uh, make a very cool implementations uh, and, and, uh, and make a future in, in these in this countries. So yeah, um, not a long speech. Um, overall, I would, I would like to say that um, the, the, the metaverse that we'll see in, in the upcoming years is not the metaverse that we have, like uh, what Mark Zuckerberg is building or what we have in the, in the blockchain space like Sandbox or the Central Land. These are not metaverses that, that will be mass adopted. Um, metaverse will be a combination of a VR, AR and AI technologies. Um, and specifically, if we're talking about AI, it's already being used for, uh, for example, integration of AI into NPCs, right, in gaming and uh, virtual worlds, or even in augmented reality um, in terms of GPS mapping and creating immersive experiences um, automatically uh, with artificial intelligence for AR glasses or just AR applications on 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 our uh, smartphones. So yeah, I think I think this is it for me. Oh, so Daniel, I have a brief question for you. So what do you think about such a thesis that, uh, of course, taking into account all the positive sides that metaverse enabling technologies can provide? For instance, let's say in corporate corporate education formats, um, even in space like uh, in the sphere of autopiloting and etc. Uh, could there potentially be some structural disadvantages? You have talked briefly about uh, developing countries, and I can clearly see the problem that, uh, of course, metaverse-enabling technologies are amazing, 
they are very aspiring and great, but uh, we should acknowledge that they are developed only in uh, countries with high rate of IT development, GDP, and etc. mostly Western European countries. Could there potentially be a situation with uh, structural disadvantage where the developed world already has access to such technologies and uses it, and the developing world once again has to uh, try to uh, reach their level of um, uh, technological sovereignty and uh, metaverse um, connectivity and is unable to do so simply because of the structural differences. What should be done about it? Should this question be addressed as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's a great question and that's a great statement from you um, because there is an absolute structural disadvantage, uh, disadvantage uh, nowadays in terms of the technology um, creation from the West Right and from uh, uh, from from the from the from from China and uh, that's why that's why I said that you know uh, first countries uh, that should properly regulate and give opportunities for startups to thrive and to build products should be uh, third world countries. Um, yeah, of course, that there is a big advantage of the um, of, of, of uh, the United States and the Europe right, in terms of. Uh, technology and it does in, in terms of uh, technological resources but, but you know a lot of things are changing nowadays and uh, that's why uh, third world uh, governments should regulate um, innovation firstly while the other other countries are trying to regulate and they have other interests uh, in, 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 in their hands so yeah Thank you very much. So maybe there are some ideas from the audience, or I'll also see that we have uh, some quite a number, of around 20 people online. I would really encourage anyone to raise their hand and uh, ask a question, or maybe propose a, a certain idea of their own. Uh, yeah, I clearly can see a gentleman over there. I do have a mic in the... Uh, oh, you do have, yeah, there's a microphone. Thank you. Um, so uh, just a few things that um, during COVID, it act, acted as a catalyst for so many different digital platforms to uh, come up and it showed us uh, some of the value proposition of uh, Metaverse. But as you know that um, the standardization process is still going on. Uh, the interoperability issues are there. Um, there have been certain projects like, for example, digital Im immortality. People have been trying to, you know, uh, if you have a digital avatar um, and it can uh, basically learn about a certain real life person. And if that person is no longer there, then the avatar lives on and how accurately it can mimic a certain person, real person. So there are certain uh, advantages of using metaverse. My question is that, for example, uh, now we have generative AI. Uh, there are talks about regulation and how AI content is going to be um, taken, for example, whether it, be, it would be acceptable in certain areas or not. There are so many different platforms which, in, which you can use, chat GPT, mid journey, you can create so many different types of content. In the metaverse, uh, uh, my question would be that how important the role of regulation would be to ensure that uh, the value proposition of metaverse uh, is uh, so much so that it, it continues to grow, and it offers a lot of opportunities for uh, people in, in uh, different countries. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah, well, yeah, is, yeah, the, is yeah, it the question? Yes, yeah. you, I, uh, can I take like a word for you? And then I will take your word for you, Daniel. <laughs> so uh, actually, have a very good uh, think about regulation. Yeah, there is a big uh, reason be why metaverse are not regulated is because we're not understand in which jurisdiction they actually operate. So IT companies made metaverse. So where do they actually exist? So basically, some people think that metaverse like the first step to the digital state. So can they afford digital citizenship to a person who actually in the metaverse? And if person I are in many metaverses. It's like he has like double citizenship or citizenship of three countries. So the question is, do we need to regulate metaverses or the IT companies and maybe create some kind of a framework for the whole metaverse conception and DLT technologies? Because we don't have like, still we don't have regulation even on the financial market of things. Like DLT, cryptocurrencies, they still exist somewhere 
in the internet without particular jurisdiction, without country, without everything. So we can't, uh, we actually not decided if uh, the IT companies just operating social networks have regulations apart from the countries they registered in. And this is, of course, a very difficult question. And maybe we're just in the first step of this. So uh, apparently, Metaverse can uh, give you the digital immortality because it's kind of a digital prison for people that are not longer with us. I can, so actually you're right in point, but I don't think that there is a uh, answer yet for the question. <laughs> Thank you. Just a couple of other things that I would like to mention is that since you mentioned digital citizenship, that also raises the question of uh, privacy related issues, jurisdictional issues, which law is going to be applied on whom. That is also a big problem that uh, needs to be uh, resolved. So um, thank you, thank you for the. Sorry, else, um, my name is, uh, just to contribute to that, I think there is actually a partial answer to some of these questions. It depends on the use case in the metaverse. So if it's anything related to personal data, there is actually regulation that already applies around digital identities, electronic signatures, payment, uh, interoperability standards, but that's a public sector use case. Yeah? So again, also with the hosting of data, as soon as it's personal data, there is regulation that governs that. Whether or not it's cloud or the metaverse, that doesn't matter. Yeah? So there are actually pieces of legislation that are already applicable to the metaverse, depending on the use case. Yes, there is some Wild West elements around NFTs and gaming, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at it from a US context, uh, a Chinese context, or European Union context, there is actually legislation in place that covers key elements of the metaverse, whether or not you use it uh, or not. So, just a little bit Th Thank you for the brief uh, contribution. I should uh, just give a word to Daniel Mazurin, and then we'll give a brief word to Vartank. So yeah, I, I would just, uh, I, would, I would like to add to um, Alina um, in, the, in, the, um, in the question that, you know, the, 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 there is no problem with regulation at all. What Alina said, um, um, I, uh, I kind of disagree with that because most of the uh, companies and startups building metaverses, they are incorporated in some countries. Uh, even crypto companies, they're incorporated usually like in Hong Kong right now or in Seychelles. So that's not the problem of regulating and really coming to these companies. The, the, the real uh, uh, question, I think, how we should uh, really regulate them. Do we need to give them a full freedom of actions or do we need to really look after them and see how it goes in the crypto or AI or metaverse because they can influence, you know, uh, Gen Z and, you know, destroy the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think uh, um, so. And the question that was asked is how we should regulate properly AI in the metaverse. Well, uh, I think that, um, you know, AI is already being regulated and all the companies that are building AI uh, they already make their uh, auto re uh, regulation by their own because if we're talking about the open AI, the biggest right now AI company, um, they they essentially make their uh, their their code regulated. So you cannot, for example, generate 18 plus contact using uh, their generative uh, AI, or you cannot ask certain questions uh, or but get answers on certain questions that are related to some uh, specific topics. Uh, but that, that could go wrong, right? So they can um, essentially uh, delete this uh, auto-regulation of the, of the AI and uh, that, that's the real problem. That's why governments should uh, pro 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 properly regulate them because AI is, is dangerous. We have to realize that. if. We, it goes beyond the the open AI servers or something something else, then it could turn into a big issue to to the to to not only the company but the humanity uh, in general. Thank you, Daniel. Um, let's give a brief word to Vartang as well. He raised the hand. 
Thank you so much. Uh, it is very remarkable that there are people here who actually raised question about digital immortality. And here, being a representative of religious organization, I would like to say that we should be very careful dividing um, religious issues and technological issues. If uh, at some stage of development of technologies, religious issues such as immortality and uh, non-religious uh, issues like, you know, technological progress uh, are being mixed. So I think it, it, uh, it is a big danger. It, it, I think, sets a big danger for humanity because, uh, uh, you know, if people believe in immortality, it is a good thing. If they can, as they think, get this immortality now and just doing some technological procedures, I think it is a, a very big just challenge because uh, uh, we cannot um, just bring a space of dogmas to the space of uh, technology. Uh, in that case, I would say mm, the, the whole just uh, uh, structure of human personality could be endangered because at some stage a person uh, will will not understand uh, whether he or she has body or doesn't have it. It is, I think, a very crucial issue to uh, just to see a difference between real world and virtual world. And sometimes, and the issue of immortality shows it, I think, in good sense, this this just mixing is is very just uh, seizable. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, I'm not. A, I don't know much about metaverse. I was wondering, um, what is the bottleneck for the uh, for the let's say the spread, uh, like the, the growth of the metaverse right now, if it is technical. And if it is technical, would it be like a lag or delay in the connections, one of the big challenges or not? Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, um, that's, that's a the great question. And I actually wanted to um, uh, say say one very important thing and uh, answer this question. The the, the real bottle, bottleneck in the in the metaverse creation and expansion uh, are uh, essentially processors because you cannot uh, really download uh, a crazy world online and to live uh, in it and to communicate with uh, other with other avatars, uh, other other people in in the, in this downloaded online world, right? So there is th this is the main technical issue for example if you open right now such metaverse as the central end and you don't have an msi computer for example gaming computer uh your notebook will uh, your computer will um, be very very um i would say um hard to process things and it, be, it will be very low so uh, this is one of the issues. Um, and if, if we're talking about the VR, for example, right, this VR glasses, uh, it's also very low and it's uh, very connected to the development of Unreal Engine and uh, uh, Unity uh, Engine. Um, so a lot, of th a lot of things of the matters uh, depend on these infrastructures. And right now you can see the, uh, a whole new upgrade from Unreal Engine uh, on how you see things uh, with using Unreal Engine, for example, you'll be able to literally uh, see every and each detail that was uh, animated, right? So yeah, there are bottlenecks, but um, sooner, sooner or later, uh, we'll see development from these engines. We'll see development from uh, computer uh, processors. So yeah, so, sooner or later, it will happen. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Claudio Agosti, and I'm a platform auditor. Uh, although I welcome the existence of regulation, I also believe uh, they cannot be seen as the solution that will guarantee us safety. 
because the regulation is the output of lobbying, because uh, regulation needs to be abstract, uh, while the violation is uh, uh, more uh, concrete and precise. And uh, uh, in the past years, we saw that uh, the only way to investigate on platform uh, misbehave was to um, have a researcher that were developing their own technology to collect evidence, study the algorithm, study the platform, and then keep them accountable through data protection authority, to uh, media reporting, or to government reporting. So the question that I believe is more for Daniel is, uh, would you allow, for example, in uh, your tool, uh, that uh, every user that is having uh, an experience can uh, save a log of what is happening? And would you accept that this log will be used to actually keep yourself accountable, or at least to raise question on why a system behaves in a certain way? Because at the end, all the experience that a person gets is individual, depend from the algorithm that will not repeat their own behavior in the future, depends on other contextual elements that will, not, will never be repeated. So only having an evidence of what has happened, a log, a video, can allow to a person that suffered something to ask for um, explanation or for retribution. Thank you. Could I, could I ask a question to a question? Is this the question uh, related to, would I allow my platform or tool to be audited or regulated? That uh, is normally defined by regulation. For example, if your platform needs to run in a sandbox, uh, if you need to document uh, if it's high risk, low risk, that uh, is unavoidable. What I was asking is something more. Because uh, normally the regulation can let you certify your tool. But then uh, the problem is never in the tool itself, but in the experience of, of your users. Are they the ones oh, suffering oh. disinformation or suffering harassment, etc.? And if there is a log, that is an individual log of your experience, that at least can allow the user to uh, ask a further question or to also offer you feedback to improve the tool. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great question, and I've personally uh, communicated with a lot of auditors, platform auditors, and you know, smart contracts auditors uh, in the space. Yeah, you know, that's that's a question of UI UX, right? So uh, it's always better to skip the uh, Q&A during the onboarding process to your tool, right? It's always better, but you will never know the data of the of your users, right? It's always better to skip, uh, uh, I don't know, authorization of the user because it's long and it's not very useful for the user because the user wants to get in touch with your product as soon as possible. He or she doesn't, the, the uh, you know, users don't want to uh, essentially register and go through all this process. So yeah, um, but uh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's essential nowadays, even even in the uh, crypto space right now, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's essential to know uh, where, who is your user or uh, what what wallet uh, the the user has, right? Um, you you essentially collect the information. The real issue how you use it, this information, because you can uh, um, you can you can get rid of frauds on your platform uh, when you know your users, right? Uh, or you can use user data to manipulate users and sell uh, this data. It's you know you know it's it's. Uh, uh, it's the, the issue of how you use uh, uh, users' data rather than do you need to collect data. Um, yeah. We have one more question. Sorry, if it's okay, um, I'll just, uh, I just have two questions, actually. One from Daniel, and I just need to know um, uh, a religious perspective on uh, since we already discussed digital immortality. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with digital immortality. What happens right now is that we have a lot of content uh, on the internet and everybody uh, who's online, uh, they leave a digital footprint, uh, you know, e even after they're dead, the, the uh, content remains uh, on different platforms. Take the example of YouTube. There are so many different lectures available from so many people. There are documentaries. You can see so much content about people. The only difference that I see uh, with Metaverse is that with digital immortality, that kind of content, I mean, if there is a digital avatar of somebody, 
you can interact with that digital avatar. With the content that we have right now, it's not interactive. If there is a video on YouTube, you can't really interact with that person. Um, so uh, from the religious point of view, uh, let's also consider AI regulation. You, I mean, AI should not be discriminatory based on religion, uh, race, uh, all those factors. So when the regulation is there, and when you talk about digital mortal immortality and somebody's digital avatar lives on, so I just want to know that why would, can it be considered a bad thing? It can have so many advantages um, for the people uh, who are related to somebody whose digital avatar lives on. Um, the second question is from Daniel regarding um, uh, the value that Metaverse has to offer. So uh, let's talk about, for example, digital assets. There was an article from McKinsey which uh, estimated that by 2030, the Metaverse is going to you know, be worth uh, $5 trillion. Uh, and there were so many reasons. Once, one reason was scarcity in the real world. So you have limited resources in the metaverse, the digital assets, uh, you know, there is no, no limit virtually. So with generative AI, now we, are, uh, we can compare that in the real world we have scarcity, but in the metaverse there is going to be abundance of everything. Now with generative AI you can generate digital assets. There are so many, so many tools through which you can generate digital assets and a lot of people are doing that. So won't that reduce the overall value of digital assets because you have scarcity in the real world, but you have abundance in the metaverse, which you know, in economic terms, abundance basically, in, in some cases, it's not good. It reduces the value of assets. So these are my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I can also add a little bit about the uh, immortal thing, immortal avatars or immortal um, digital, your digital persona. Um, but uh, let's start with the, with the second question. So uh, first of all, you have to realize that in the metaverse, uh, in the ideal, uh, let's say, type of uh, metaverse, uh, you will essentially uh, own your items and assets. So there'll not be an unlimited supply of items and assets, uh, what can be produced. Of course, if we're talking about the generative AI, right now the, um, let's say the, the utility and the, the, the price of uh, 3D rendered uh, artworks, you know, have, uh, have been uh, uh, recently declined because we, you, right now you don't need to hire a 3D artist, you can go just to, uh, you know, a generative artificial intelligence and uh, make your own art, right? But it's still, you know, you can consider this as something that creates unlimited supply, but also you can consider it as a tool, right? Because right now, a lot of 3D artists, for example, they use a generative AI to generate pictures and they add their art onto it and it, it becomes even uh, brightful and more beautiful. So yeah, back to the metaverse thing. Uh, there is still uh, a, will not be unlimited supply of assets and items because you know it's supply and demand. You have to sell um, NFTs, for example, if we're talking about blockchain-based uh, based metaverse. You have to sell NFTs, have to sell NFT lands, or you know your clothes or your avatar. So there will always be a limited supply in order to create the demand. Um, so yeah, that's, that's in short. So in terms of um, uh, immortality issue, I um, strongly support this question and I believe that there is a future in that. Uh, I truly believe that, that creating an AI for, for your relative uh, who has died unfortunately uh, is, can be a good thing, but we um, essentially we, we cannot go too far with that uh, because um, I don't think that in terms of religious point of view, uh, that's, uh, that's a moral thing to do, right? So there will always be uh, such issues. But in terms of people who are willing to do this and uh, who don't have any religious you know, bottlenecks or who are not religious or whose religion allows them to do so, then why not do this, right? Because you can, you can always communicate with, uh, with, uh, with the person who is very important to you and you'll be able to do that, right? 
So yeah, thank you so much for your questions. Very, very interesting questions. So thank you very much, Daniel uh, and our Dear colleagues, uh, I think that time is running out, as our colleagues have already shown us. I thank everyone for involvement in the discussion, and, and I also would like to invite you to, after the session discussion, if you have any questions, we'll be glad to talk in private. Ah, and also a small notice, uh, tomorrow our organization organizes a soiree. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we would also love to invite all of you to partake. Uh, we'll give a more precise information after the session. Yeah. Thank you very much, all of you. <laughs>